Good morning and happy Sabbath and welcome everyone. I am so glad that you are here with us this morning. We are excited about what God is getting ready to do for us and through us. I don't know about you, but we've been going through a lot over the last two plus years. Um, but I believe that God is just trying to get our attention. And I just want to, um, I hope that today um, the word of God, the songs um, do something to help you to get back on track, to help you to refocus because God has a word for us. I want to welcome you this morning to our worship services. Oh, magnify the Lord, for he is worthy to be praised. Hey, put your hands together. Oh, magnify the Lord, for he is worthy to be praised. Oh, magnify the Lord, for he is worthy to be praised. Hosanna, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna, blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Oh, dance before the Lord. Hey, he is worthy to be praised. Oh, dance before the Lord. Like David did, he is worthy to be praised. Lift your voice, Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Come on. For he is worthy to be praised. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Hey, for he is worthy to be praised. The Lord, the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Oh, shout, oh, shout before the Lord, for He is worthy to be praised. Has he done wonderful things? Oh, shout for the Lord. Hey, for he is worthy to be praised. Yes, your voice goes in. Blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord live it. Blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be its all. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna. Blessed be in the morning. Blessed in the evening. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. It was unusual to see Luis Augusto sober whenever he came back home from Rodriguez Alves Acre, Brazil. Now, sometimes he would be gone drinking for several days, harming not only himself, but also his family. Conversion seemed distant. One day, while watching an evangelist preaching on Novo Tempo TV, the Brazilian Hope Channel, Luis decided to accept the Lordship of Jesus for the first time. He was then determined to find the Adventist church he had learned about from the TV. The following Sabbath, he left his home at 3 a.m. for a four-hour walk through the jungle, looking for the Adventist church. Not able to locate the church, he sat on the curb for a while. Then, some people dressed for church passed by, and Luis followed them until he found the house of God. At the door, the receptionist asked him if he was visiting the church. His answer was clear. No, I came to stay. And so he did. The Lord delivered Luis from his bad habits, and he was baptized. 
His family started to join him every Sabbath, walking four hours one way to church. You may wonder if such sacrifice is worth it, considering it seems way more convenient to stay home and watch religious programs on the screen. Well, God's word is clear when it says that in order to stir up love and good works, we need to consider one another, connecting with them constantly. And the next verse warns us, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Luis realized that no virtual experience could replace regular worship with our brothers and sisters in church whenever that experience is available. The physical church is God's house of prayer, the place where we can worship Him through prayer, hymns, the study of His Word, and the return of our tithe and promise. As you return your tithe and give your promise, remember what the Lord has done for you this week. May we rejoice and worship Him. May we put our desires last and God first. Let's bow our heads. Loving Father, again, we are so thankful. First of all, that you woke us up this morning, and second of all, that you call us your children. We are so thankful and appreciative this morning. We woke up and the sun is shining, and we woke up, and it might have been a little cold wherever we may be, but, but the truth is that we've got our limbs, and we're able to walk and talk, and, and we've got all of the things that we need because you are a gracious God. And so before we ask for anything, we just want to say thank you for being that kind of God. Now we pray, dear Lord, that you remember all of the requests that were mentioned in the comment section, in the chat section, wherever they may be. Lord, I pray in a special way that you would be with us and speak to us in urgent simplicity as we get ready to open your word. Just as we differ in faces, Lord, we also differ in needs. And we ask that you would meet our needs so that everybody would be able to say that God is good to the just and to the unjust. God is gracious to those who will and to those who won't. God is a God of love, and he loves all his children. Bless every family, bless this service, and in the end, Lord, help it so that somebody could say, I was glad to be in God's house today. Is our prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and amen. God bless you. 15, uh, 1 through 6. All right. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And seeing I store of the houses. And Abram said, Behold to me. Thou hast given me, giving no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine here. And five, uh, and he bought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them and hear them unto him, so shall thy seed be. All together, six. Behold in the world.
of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What happens to us today is related to what happened yesterday. There's always a connecting link between history and the present. Pray on Monday gives power on Tuesday. Worship on Sabbath gives strength for Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. The victory of one day may fortify us in the trial of the next. The adversity of yesterday may bring humility and confession today. So it is that it is after these things that you read in your text today of Genesis chapter 15. The first three words, after these things, 
that our meaningful truths can be learned, new heights attained, new goals realized when we review yesterday, when we review after these things. But it is paramount that we go back and we review the past. That we may have strength and insight and discernment and understanding for the presence that will propel us for the future. The daily life of faith becomes both the foundation and the stepping stone for new and greater experiences. When we look over yesterday, we take a moment to review the past. It gives us hope and encouragement for the present because many of us are sitting here today because of what others did for us yesterday. This time of celebration of June 19th is very paramount for us as blacks living in the U.S. because it's vital for us to look back over history because in 1863, a hundred years after the Emancipation Proclamation, they were still telling us to wait. And the tragedy that is signed and is proclaimed in the middle of a war, but yet in Texas, two years after the war, the federal government has to send troops down to Texas to free the slaves in Texas. That is the crime. And it wasn't as though it went under the radar that the nation wasn't aware that yet in Texas they were still enslaved because slave owners were moving to Texas to hold on to what they call their property. So if we don't review so we can celebrate what we have today, we're going to be close to repeating and allowing the same things to happen again. So when Dr. King was in Birmingham and as he were planning a march, Bull Connor said, we're not letting them come to disrupt our community. So he went and got an injunction to make the march illegal. But King was aware and the leaders were aware of what they were doing. And they knew that if they go, they will be arrested. And, and actually, some historians say that King knew exactly what he was doing to allow himself to be arrested. That it may draw Popular, att popular attention, that it may draw the media so they can see and that it will create a platform to make the world aware of what's going on in Alabama. So King goes to prison in 1860. He goes to jail in 1863. And so about eight clergy in the, in the community wrote him a letter, 1963, telling him that maybe you're moving too fast. Maybe you should wait. So I just want to read to you a portion of his response today. Now remember, this is a hundred years. Not a hundred days, my brothers and sisters. This is a hundred years afterwards. And they're still saying, wait. That's why when we protested in 2020, you saw some young people on this with their signs that said, when you say wait, what you're saying is never, and we are not settling for it. So I just want to read to you a portion of his, of his letter from the Birmingham jail, which is a classic, my brothers and sisters. If you ever get the time, read it, but I'm just going to share a portion of it. King replies, after reading the newspaper, as a matter of fact, it wasn't a private letter. They published it in the newspaper. So King says, oh, man, a boy was smart. If you want to go public, so therefore I will go public. I guess it's easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have been vicious, when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have been hate, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters with impunity,
when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her little eyes when she is told that fun town is closed to colored children and see the depressing cloud of inferiority begin in her little mental sky and see her begin to distort her little personality by unconsciously developing a bitterness toward white people. When you take a cross country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no, mo mo no motel will accept you. When you are humiliated day in and day out by the nagging signs reading white men and colored. When your first name becomes nigga and your middle name becomes boy, however old you are. And when your wife and mother never receive, never, are never given the respected title missus. When you are hurried by and hunted, when you're hurried by day and hunted by night, by the fact that you are a Negro living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and plagued with interferes and outer resentment. When you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. Dr. Kling, Dr. King's goal is clear. He is seeking desperately and passionately to get the white Christian leaders from that city to walk in the shoes of an African American. You've heard the Native American saying to truly understand other human beings, you must first walk a mile in their moccasins. Dr. King was illustrating and making it very clear that as long as you stand on this side and never have to experience what we are experiences, experiencing, you will never understand what it feels like. And you can constantly tell us to wait. But we can wait no longer. My brothers and our, my sisters today, those who are watching and those who are here, I will encourage you to always remember and appreciate your black heritage, your African-American heritage, to be free that one time, at one time in this country, that this country, founded on liberty, denied a certain group of people that freedom. And the more and more we go back and we can tell our children where we've come from, it will make an impact on their present day situation. And just take it from our text today, when, Ad, when a Abram had come to a point in Genesis chapter 15, it starts off with the first verse, first three, three words, after these things. And one has to go back and say, Abram, what were you experiencing yesterday? It calls our attention immediately to the events and experiences of yesterday in the life of the patriarch. Genesis 14 gives us essential details. In Genesis chapter 14, we're looking back over what happened to Abram during that time. On yesterday, Abram did something wonderful for someone else. In Genesis 14, verse 16, his nephew Lot had, been, had, had fallen captive to the kings of the east. Abram could have reasoned that Lot brought on his own problems by his careless choices and covetous intentions, Genesis 3, 13. And, his, and this certainly would have been true. But godly, however, 
Abram resisted personal risk, personal danger against great odds, and at much sacrifice to rescue his nephew from capture and likely premature death. Understand, my brothers and sisters, I'm still still sticking with our theme keeping and making God first. And we remember the last time I was here, Lot, they had to split up, and Lot chose to move towards Sodom. And as he moved towards Sodom, he began to pitch his tent, but eventually he moved into the city. And at the very moment, there were kings from the east planning a military strike against the city. And so Lot and his entire family were taken captive. Abram looks at the situation and says he made the decision. He decided to move there, so he's going to face the consequences. No, Lot, I mean, Abram considered the situation and said, beyond, regardless of that, he is my nephew. I'm going to go and rescue him. He risked his life, and he went to pursue his nephew. He could have said he made the choice. He must live with it. But in reality, he moved there, and there was a military coup that was going against him. And so sometimes, my brothers and sisters, our family and our friends are in situations that sometimes God will allow us to pass by and to give them a helping hand and not just to condemn them. Can I take a moment here and part? Because sometimes in this political arena, you hear people make gestures as though every black person that's in the hood is their fault. Little children have no choice. This is the circumstances they're born in. And to criticize and say, couldn't they do better? Look at the schools they're in. They have no choice. And if God puts us in a position to help, help. Don't sit there and condemn and say your mother and your daddy were foolish in all kinds of situations. If it wasn't for the grace of God, all of us would still be there. There are challenges in the cities. There are challenges in the communities that people are facing. And sometimes it's beyond their control. It's the sick situation they were born in. It was the cars they were dealt. And they are learning to survive. If we're going to be real as a church... To be honest, we're not that far away from them. It's just been the grace. We just know how to dress a little better and talk a little better. But sometimes our habits and practices are just like them. We just know how to come to church on Sabbath. So Abram risked his life, oh, his reputation, his status among the community. His Abram that built altars everywhere he went, but yet this man says, I got to go rescue my nephew. I'm going to put myself in a situation to help somebody. And he makes the move and he goes and he rescues them. Sometimes when we decide to help others, it's not going to look good. It may be risky sometimes. It may put a stamp on our reputation to others, but in the sight of God, we are right. Yesterday, Abram goes and Abram, he rescues his nephew. We're still talking about yesterday because he's reviewing because God is having an encounter with him. And I want y'all to stay with me, my brothers and sisters. And so while he was there and Abram, and he comes back after he rescues them, he meet Melchizedek, that priest from Salem and he embraced God at Salem in true spiritual experience of praise and worship one of the things that encounters here in verses 14 in chapter 14 verse 20 Abram decides to worship after the victory blessed be the most high God and then he returns to Melchizedek a tithe oh I wish I had time right there because here we got a man returning tithes before there was an Israelite, or Israelite nation so tithe is not something that came up when God established his nation. It was already in existence and a practice prior to that. Are y'all there with me? And so it, it is not contingent upon, hey, hey, personal or human performance. It's based upon a relationship with Jehovah. Are you there with me, my brothers and sisters? Are y'all there with me? 
So my returning, my praise to God is to God and God alone. And so my returning of a tithe and offering is contingent upon my relationship with God, not with human beings. Because Satan would put plenty of failures in front of your face for you to come up with all kinds of excuses for not worshiping nor returning to God what is due. Are you there with my brothers and sisters? This is not that sermon, but Abram, after the victory, stay with me. After the victory, he worshiped. And he returned in his worship. So in his worship experience, he was giving something to God. He didn't neglect the fact that where he has gained victory, he did not take praise and success to himself. But he acknowledged the God of heaven who gave him the victory. Are you there with me, my brothers and sisters? So when you make it, when you achieve that next social level, when you move to that next level financially, when you move to that secluded neighborhood, when you get all the letters behind your name, when you have your children doing the same, don't forget to worship the one who blessed you to get there. Don't think this is you. This was a nomad. He wasn't a military man. This man was a farmer that took care of sheep, but he went to war and he realized that my victory was by the grace of God and no one else. And so after the victory, he praised his name. I want to encourage you while you're climbing that ladder, praise his name, worship him. Don't become so successful that you think it's all about you. Some of us make it and then we just exclude God all out the picture. God is not intellectual enough for me. Those people, they, they worship. I, I don't preach it the way they worship. That's just not my style. And I'm telling you, it's not something from, from just saying. I'm telling you from experience. We have those who have grown up. Oh, Lord, help me, help me. Grown up in the hood. To churches, went to churches in the hood. Mm -hmm. And they grow up and they make it. And then they say that same church in the hood is just a poor, pitiful church. They're still doing the same old things they did when I was a child. But the same old thing that got you through is the same old, old people who was putting their 2 and $3 together to help give you and your mama some extra bread when you were growing up. The same old people who were putting a little change in your pocket when you were going to college. Those same old people who were helping you get to the next level. But now they're no good. <laughs> when we forget yesterday... We're, we're destined to fail today. Yeah. I want to, I just want to, I, I want to remind you of something here, church. It's vital for you to remember yesterday. God was very intentional. I don't know if you remember the story when, in, in Joshua chapter 4, when, 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 they were crossing into the promised land. They crossed over to Jordan. Y'all remember that biblical story? I don't need to go there, do I? But I'm just giving you a story. There's a biblical story in Joshua chapter 4 when they're about to enter the promised land. And God says, listen, Joshua, I want you to go over. And, but when you go through, I want you to do me a favor, Joshua. There are 12 nations or tribes. I want you to get one stone to represent each tribe. That when you go over into the promised land, I want you to set these stones up. And when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? You tell them how the, the story of how God brought y'all through and to cross the Jordan at this time. Set it up as a memorial because I don't want them to forget. Because human nature tends to forget. Then when they, when, when, when in, in the story of 1 Samuel chapter 7, Samuel, the priest, goes to war, and they win a war. And Samuel sets up what he called an Ebenezer, which means hitherto hath the Lord helped us. God was teaching his people the, the, the principle of 
remember how good I've been to you. What caused the people of Israel to go back into the wilderness for 40 years? Because God said, you forgot that I was the God that delivered you out of Pharaoh's hand. And they was right at the edge of the promised land, my brothers and sisters, but they forgot. And you know something I've done, my brothers and sisters? This is just my testimony. I share with you Exhibit 8. This is one of my Ebenezer's. I've been keeping Ebenezer's whew, since the 90s. And all I do is go in here and I try my best on a regular basis, on a daily basis. I can't say every day, but pretty much on a regular basis. I take a couple of minutes and I just record me seeing God work in my life in the last 24 hours. And I have in here my journey with God, just blessings on blessings on blessings on blessings. So my wife saw me bring this to the car this morning. She said, oh, it's going to be an Ebenezer sermon today. <laughs> yeah, 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 babe. Because I can't forget what God has done for us. See, see, I can't forget one, one, one June, one, no, 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 yeah, 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 one September night. It was a Thursday evening. My mother-in-law was just sitting at home, and she felt impressed. I need to go see my daughter. I just need to get in the car and go see my daughter. So that Thursday, she got in the car, Sister Bugua, and she drove about six hours. And when she got there, the kids were just happy. Our kids were young. This is nearly 17 years ago. The kids were young. They were having a good time. That very night, my wife was rushed to the emergency room, and her life was almost taken. And I said, God, in your mercy, in your mercy, someone was here to watch their kids while I jumped up in the middle of the night to take my wife to the doctor. I can't forget something like that, my brothers and sisters. I cannot forget. I will, I prime, I ask God, please help me never forget stuff like that. Because see, what happens over time, I have a host of them. You're talking about 20 something years. I have a host of them because they become my journey. Mm -hmm. It's not David. It's not Moses' story. It's not Joshua's stories. It's not Dennis Baptiste's story. It's not the Hines story. This is Harold Thomas' story all the way with God. And I record blessings in there of God blessing my wife and blessing my children. And every now and then I put some of y'all blessings in there. But I challenge you. My challenge today, I want you guys to try that. Set an Ebenezer. Start today. Just for a week, just for one week. And I want you to do pick a time, set your alarm on your watch, on your phone. And every day for about five minutes, let it go off. And you just want to write down, seeing God work in your life in the last 24 hours. And when I sit down and I think, sometimes it's, I thank you for life, health, and strength. I thank you for my wife's beautiful smile. I thank you for my children's energy and happiness. But sometimes I have to write down, God, we were traveling about through 2 o'clock in the morning and the car broke down in the middle of the night. Tire went flat and you got four little girls, seven years and under, in the car. It's 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and the tire is flat and we're packed from a trip. And the spare is in the middle of the van where you have to open, pull up the thing and you got to get it out. And the tools are back there with all the clothes. You know, when the kids are young, man, you stack plenty of clothes. Anybody travel when the kids are young, man? It's like, whoo, man, it's so much, man. Like, you got the little portable bed and just, just pack. Oh, diapers. Don't get me on diapers, y'all. Don't get me on diapers, man. I bought diapers for 10 years straight because they kept coming. So we have all this stuff, and I got to pull out in the middle of the night, and I got to get this tool, and this truck's just rolling down. And you got to jack that thing up, and kids in there, you got to figure out how you're going to keep everybody safe. But you know, I just thank God. Thank God we made it. Man, I don't take it for granted. So what's my point, Lord? Try that, Ebenezer. Talk to me next week. That's my challenge. It's just a piece of paper you can do. I, I don't even keep it in the books anymore. I just type it up now. I keep it electronically. So if you ever ask me, do I have a testimony? Oh, I got testimonies. I have them because I don't want to forget yesterday. 
I don't want to forget yesterday. Now, 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 I said I wasn't going to keep you long. It's already 1230. All right, so, so, so listen, so, so, so now here's, here's thinking I think something is great here. Abraham, Abraham, I want y'all to see something here. Y'all stay with me on this one. I'm just going to throw this point in. I'm going to try to throw it in quick. Abraham wins the war. He worships God. Y'all watch me now. So he comes back with the spoil. The kings of Sodom, is, they lay out all the spoil. This is all the thing they captured from the, from the enemy. And they say, Abram, take what you want. We'll take the rest. Abram says, no. I'm not going to take that because I don't want you to think my riches came from you, but they come from the God of heaven. I was like, whoa. So he worshiped God. He returned to God, but yet he refused the world's riches because he didn't want the world to think that you made me, but I'm made by God. But also I watched something. I just want to throw this in. Y'all got to get me on this one. I learned something. Sometimes you have to say no to certain gifts. Because certain gifts from certain people are traps. Are y'all there with me on that one? Because sometimes people give you gifts, they come back and cash in a little later. Politicians have learned that the hard way. Over and over. We support you. Yeah, man, come to this yacht. Bring your family. Spend the weekends on the yard. We'll just go out for a couple, for the weekend. We'll just have a good time hanging out. But then once you get in the office, they don't say anything. About a year later, you're in office. They knocking on the door. You cash in. Can I get a little bit more personal now? Sisters? Just because he offers to pay their rent doesn't mean you need to accept that rent payment he's not your spouse you might want to hold back a little bit I know the light bills are due and the gas is due and he shows up right on time he's struggling he see you struggling so he said listen girl I'll go ahead and give you some money take out that utility bill don't worry about it I got you covered but you know it not every gift is truly free. Sometimes it's better to go with your lights off than have somebody move in and try to take control of your life. Are y'all there with me? Are y'all there with me, my brother? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sometimes it's better to sit in dark a little while with the Lord on your side than to have your bills paid and someone with his shoes in your closet. Asking you when you're going to make meal and he have not put a ring on it yet. Oh, I better stop that. I'm in Adventist church. I don't know. Not every gift is good because I hear a true story of a lady, young girl. She was at church testifying and she was a grad student. She was talking about her struggles. She was trying to get up and finish up grad school. So she get a call from a, mem- a member. She goes over to the house, visits. Oh, no, no, no. He comes, visits her. And said, listen, I heard your testimony. I heard your prayer request. Just here, here here's a couple of thousand dollars to help pay for you. As a matter of fact, it was 10 to go ahead and pay for your tuition so you can go ahead and finish school. But see, this is where, this is, this is where her antennas went up. Y'all listen to me. This is just very practical. Y'all, please forgive me. I just got to be real with you. Gotta reach ground, it has to reach ground level. This is where her antennas went up. This just be a secret between me and you. My wife doesn't need to know about it. Yeah, that's how y'all should respond every time. Because whenever you go into a, a situation where you're keeping secrets with a married man, that's a bad sign. Are y'all there with me, my brothers and sisters? Brothers, it's the same way on your end. If you keep in secrets with a married woman and a husband doesn't know, you won't have problems later on. Because as an old lady in my church used to always say, what's in the dark?
So the, the young lady was very smart. She says, no, thank you. But I cannot accept that. Neither when I go into this covenant with you apart from your wife. Now, you could have thought, man, God has answered my prayers. <laughs> like Abram, you got to know when to say no to even good things. And choose to say yes to the best things. Are oh, you there with my brothers and sisters? Man, you know what? My sermon title was yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and I haven't even gotten to today yet. So I, I'm not going to hold you. I, I, I'm going to move through. Because I see some people here. I want y'all to come back again. Or I want you to watch again. So, so Abram refused the world's spoils for greater riches, and he knew that his blessings come from God. Just as Abram embraced God through the meaningful experience of worship and giving, he recognized God in his refusal of Sodom's substance. Christians must ever realize that there are appropriate times to embrace and other things to embrace and other things that are too be refused. There's another side to this truth. Yesterday's experiences may become shackles rather than stepping stones if we cling to them and do not have fresh experiences with God each day. One of my favorite Christian authors, Ellen G. White, in her classic book, The Desire of Ages, says on page 382, she says, day by day, God instructs his children by circumstances of the day of the daily life, he is preparing them to act their part upon the wider stage to which his providence has appointed them. It is the issue of daily tests that determines their victory or defeat in life's great crises. Mm. Paul says, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before. In Philippians 3.13, what does this mean? Obviously, the intent of this passage is to remind us that yesterday's failures are not to hinder us with today's opportunities. Likewise, yesterday's successes are not to lull us into inactivity through a sense of false security. So, my brothers and sisters, we got freedom. We got freedom from slavery. We must celebrate that, but we must plant our feet for today as well. For the Bible says, and it said here to, to Abram, after these things, some good stuff in here, and I'm going to bring it. I told you, I, I keep saying it, but I'm just going to stop saying it, just preach it. We have a need today for protection and provision. God says to him, listen what God, God is coming to visit Abram again. And he says, it says here, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in vision. In a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. The coward is afraid before battle. The hero after the battle is over. The prophet Elijah in 1 Kings 18 displayed courage against the false prophets of Baal, but was gripped with fear before the ruthless Jezebel. So the coward is afraid before the battle, the hero after the battle, after he let his guards down. We must ever be mindful that God is with us and God tells Abram, fear not. We have a need today for the word of the Lord to come to us. The word of the Lord came unto Abram in, Genesis, in verse 1. Such is better than Melchizedek's blessing and far better than Sodom's offer for the spoils of this world. God was his reward, not the spoil of Sodom substances and not simply in having the blessing of Melchizedek. Each day, against the background of needs, fears, and doubts, there is nothing more assume, assuring and more fortifying than the Word, which is alive and penetrating and powerful. 
We have a need today for divine protection. The word of the Lord says, says, I am thy shield. The shield of faith is part of the whole armor of God. It enables its bearer to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one since it is satanic since it is satanic strategy to hurl darts at, at us as Christians, we need constant shield of protection from God. And I want this, I'm trying to make this last point, and I'll cut the rest of it short because I want you all to get this. My, one of my main theses for today. We have a need today for, provi for divine provision. The Bible says in Genesis 15, 1, I don't want you to pass over it. God says... I am thy exceeding great reward. Remember this, my brothers and sisters. The whole is greater than its part. Is a true mathematical form formula. Abram was rich even though he refused to appropriate to himself the spoils of war. The greatest wealth is God, not the spoils. Are y'all there with me, my brother? God says, I am your reward. Do not fear. I am your reward. I am your exceedingly, your exceeding great reward. Paul wrote of the divine supply of riches. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. The psalmist in poetic praise says, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Psalm 73 verse 26. God is our exceeding great reward. He is adequate, plenteous, all-sufficient. The greatest satisfaction comes from experiencing Jehovah as our portion and reward. Your prayer should be, Father, take me to the place where I want the healer more than the healing. I want the Savior more than the saving. I want the giver more than the giving. I want... The freer more than freeing. I want the planner more than the planning. Jesus, take me to the place where I want you more than anything. Are y'all there with me? I'm going to pause on this because I want you to get this. We got to get to the point where we want God more than anything. Not just the healing. I need God. Are y'all there with me, my brothers and sisters? Sometimes God takes us places and he keeps us there to the point where we want him more than the healing, more than the deliverance, more than the financial blessing. I need you, God. Because what happens sometimes, we come running to God when we need to heal, and then once he heals, we run away from him. Get me to the point, Father, where if you choose not to heal me, I'm still with you. If you choose to heal me, I'm still with you. I want you, Father, more than anything. And God told Abram, listen, I am thy exceeding and great reward. It is me you want and it is me you need. But sometimes we get frustrated because God doesn't heal us. Because sometimes he brings himself into our worlds not just to give us the healing, because he wants a relationship with you. So God says, listen, Abram. God says, listen, Abram. After these things, look over your life. See how faithful I've been. When you abandoned me in Egypt, I was still with you. I still saved your wife and I saved you. When you went to war, I saved you and I delivered you, Abram. I want you, Father. I want you, Abram. It's been 10 years since the journey. So after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in vision saying, do not be afraid. Abram, I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is, El is Eleazar of Damascus? Then Abram said, look. You have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Y'all see what Abram is doing here? God is coming to, to reassure him. God is, Abram is saying, God, you telling me all these things, but I don't have a child. It's been 10 years since you gave me the promise, Lord, and I still don't have a child. 
You tell me I'm going to have all these children, but I haven't produced anyone, and the only heirs I have is a servant that's in my house. But God says here in verse 5, no, 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 verse 4, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars. If you are able to number them and he shall, and he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Verse 6 is key to theology. It says here, and he believed in the Lord and he accounted him to it to him as righteousness. My brothers and sisters, I stand away from my, my notes. I bring home to you this statement. Abram was six, ten years into his journey with God. And it was still another 15 years before Abram will have his first child. But the Bible says God takes him outside and look at the stars. Can you count them? You can't count them. In another place, God tells him, Look at, the sand of, look at the sand of the sea. Can you count them? He can't count them. Look at the dust of the ground. Your seeds will be as the dust, the sand, and the stars. You can't count them. And did God come through? Yes. But the Bible says here, Abram believed, and God counted to him as righteousness. I'm going to get a little theological here. I want you all to get something here. Have you ever heard debates about righteousness by faith? Righteousness by faith, you'll hear it. You probably have heard it. You're trying to say, how do we justify? Notice, Abram believed and God credited to him as righteousness. Y'all follow me now. That means he was made right with God because he believed. Remember, God gave the credit, not Abram earned the credit. Mm, mm, mm. The Bible says he credited him, he accounted to him as righteousness. So God says, I'm going to make you right with me based upon my credit, not your credit. Oh, we serve a good God. Y'all better get this one. We serve a good God. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation. It is God's gift to all of us. He counts us as righteous by faith. We believe that Jesus died on cross on Calvary for our sins we believe that he forgives us and he accounts it for us as righteousness there's nothing you have done to make yourself righteous as a matter of fact Isaiah says our righteousness is as filthy rags so God does the credit and God gives the grace God gives what it takes to be righteous it's not we and ourselves I want to encourage you when you hit low points in your life like Abram, you've been 10 years walking with the Lord, but you're on a 25-year journey, and God hasn't given, you the, hasn't given you that promise. I want you to look up and trust that God is your true reward. If he chooses to give you financial blessings, so be it. If he chooses to heal you, so be it. If he chooses to give you what you need, so be it. But if he chooses not to give it to you, keep trusting in him keep holding on to him get God out of everything you do more than anything so that you can die in peace so that you can be in sickness and peace because it's not easy walking this Christian walk it's not easy because when you have curveballs that come your way and they will they will I want you to trust God all the way trust God develop a relationship with God more than anything. Pastor, what are you trying to say? Get a relationship with Jesus Christ. Make Jesus be the object and not just the healing. You do whatever you can to heal. I don't want you to be negligent and saying, you know, don't, don't, please don't, please do not misinterpret what I'm saying. Please do not go up there and have the medicine on the counter and the medicine can heal you, but you say God will heal you without taking the medicine. And I'm not saying that. Because the blessing could be in the his healing could come through the medicine. Please, please, don't have a headache talking about God to heal me this headache. And you, you, you need, oh, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that through all of it, 
God is the reward. A relationship with Jesus is the ultimate goal. So whatever you're going through, maybe Jesus is drawing you to him. So take my challenge for today. Write your Ebenezer. Take my challenge for today. Pray to God, I want you more than anything. I want you, God, more than anything. My brothers and sisters, and don't forget to look back on yesterday. We've come a long way. Today, we're living off the blessings of yesterday. And tomorrow, God told Abram, look out and start to see God has great blessings for us tomorrow. We got to hold on to him, and he's going to take us where he has us. He has a blessing for you. He has it. And listen. Well, I'm not going there. I'm not, that's a whole other sermon. I just want to walk with Jesus. I'm bringing this to an end. I want to walk with Jesus. And that's my appeal to all of us today. Is I just want to walk with Jesus. I don't want to pray for us right now. Let's pray. Gracious God of heaven. Thank you. Thank you for the Civil War. It was a necessary thing. Though it was bloody and many died. And it's a shame that a country had to come to this point. But thank you for it. That it started and continued a process for people to be set free. It was not right for other humans to treat other humans like the way slaves were treated. Thank you for the Emancipation Proclamation. It was just the proclamation, Father, that was written. And it started a process so many of us here today can live in freedom. But there's a lot more work to be done, Lord. As there were lynches in the past and there was no accountability, so are blacks are being killed and people are being killed without any justice. So I'm asking that you continue to step in and then we ask that you would commission us to do our part in the process. We also, Father, when we look back over yesterday, many of us are here because of your goodness. We thank you for that. We know by your grace and your mercy you've taken care of us, and we say thank you today. You've been good to us in so many ways. You've paid bills, you protected, you watch over the children, you've given us jobs that we didn't even qualify for, and you've kept us and sustained us. You gave us promotions and raises to meet the needs and demands of our family. You've kept us healthy, Father, through our seasons of working. You've given us health insurance when we needed to go to the doctor, and then when we didn't have it, you still healed us and sustained us. Father, you kept tires going when they were bald to get us from place to place without exploding. You kept gas in the car, even when the prices are up. God, you've been good. We just want to acknowledge your goodness in our lives. But also, Father, we ask that we will trust you more in now and in the days ahead. Help us to trust you to the end, and we thank you for the righteousness of Christ that stands in our stead. That is through Christ that we are made whole. And we thank you for Christ going to Calvary to pay the penalty for our sins. For we are all sinners saved by grace. Thank you for your grace. May we never forget that, Father. May we acknowledge it day by day. And Father, I pray if there's someone under the sound of my voice that's here or watching online that's not walking with you but desire to walk with you, Father, I pray that your spirit will please move upon their heart their hearts and help them to make a decision today for there if there are individuals here today that used to walk with you but are not walking with you that have turned their backs on you or just become indifferent to you I'm asking that your spirit will move upon their hearts and minds and bring them back today 
So if it's you, my brother, my sister, if you're here today and you're not walking with Christ or you desire to walk closer to Christ, that you want to make Christ your end and your true reward, just raise your hand in the air and say, God, it's me. I want to walk closer to you. I want to walk with you always. I never want to turn my back on you nor become indifferent. Just raise your hand and let the angels acknowledge that it's you. They're saying, Lord, I want you. I want to keep you a part of my life. I want to walk with you all the days of my life. Father, the hands are raised and they've gone back down. For the person that's watching online, I ask that, Lord, that they will fill out our form online. Go to our website, sdashiloh.org, and fill out the reply form. And may they choose to follow you. We love you. We thank you, Father. Not only the freedom from slavery of this world, but the freedom from slavery from sin. Thank you for your deliverance. Keep on delivering us, Father, in Jesus' name.